Thank you, Emma, for your kind words, and thank you for everything ETAC does with our teachers. It is a privilege to be here this morning. It is Sunday, and yet here you are, so hats off to you. If I was wearing my little Kubra there, I would have done the whole, um, the, you know, the real deal. So I think we're pretty much all in the right place because of the way the day has been structured, but Essential English Unit 4. Before we go any further, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land and pay our respects to the elders past, present and future. I'm going to keep introductions about me very brief because I'm the mere messenger. I look after a range of subjects at QCAA and I'm the other person on the end of the telephone if you ring up about those particular subjects. I'm also a member of the endorsement working group. Kylie Wilson is the Principal Education Officer for this syllabus and she's presenting elsewhere right now as we speak, so I'm here for her. So, you know, she is the face of the syllabus. But I've done a lot of work with Kylie with it. Um, in terms of us as a group, some of these questions have been asked earlier. So I'm not going to ask them, not all of these, but when I do come to a question that I would like some information on, if you wouldn't mind just raising your hand. I know from previously that a lot of us teach English communication and that was the case when I was here in May. This question, who has designed Unit 1 and Unit 2? Okay, thank you. No judgement. It just helps me ground my message. Who can see the Essential English Syllabus working in their, in their context? Okay, all right. Who's not sure yet? That's interesting and that's absolutely fine too. This is part of the process. Who's been to an essential PD workshop? All right, yes, so most of us, so you have an understanding. And who's excited about implementing this syllabus? <laughs> okay. A lot of us are very excited, some unsure. And that's part of the journey. So here we are. Essentially, we're climbing the cliff of the new. That's how I see it. That's actually my son, so, it's, um, so I'm not bothered by copyright. But really, I think over the last 12 months, having an eye on what's happening in the state and talking to lots of teachers, it's been a huge swathe of emotions, anticipation, frustration, anger, excitement, and anticipation, apprehensive, all those things. And yet here we are, we're almost at the top to climb out, the, out of the lip. And 2019 really is only a few months away, so we're very, very close now. In terms of learning goals for this really short session, it's about the syllabus document, that's the go-to place for everything we do at QCAA, pretty much, and the handbook. Because there is all our information about curriculum assessment and supporting practice and there are lots of really good examples in that syllabus. Just as I did last time, I'm going to mention quality assurance very briefly because that seems to be the source of most anxiety across the state. And that's probably because it's beyond our control, it's beyond the school level. There are requirements that we need to, um, need to meet. And things are changing across the state. But just to mention that quality assurance is happening in Units 1 and 2. Schools have been crying out for it. What it exactly looks like, we're not sure yet. In Units 3 and 4, there will be endorsement and applied meetings. So there is quality assurance. In terms of classroom considerations, what that really means is that we need to have a high level of assessment literacy. We need to really understand those objectives in great detail. And for the first time ever, Queensland teachers are going to be governed by certain dates um, that are set for us all. So that's new as well. In terms of endorsement, very, very quickly, schools develop their assessment. Is there an echo? Yeah, there is. Is that problematic for the recording? Is it annoying anyone? It will come to annoy you. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so assessment is provided, is done using the QCAA provided template. We've had a lot of positive feedback about that. And schools will be using the QCAA provided resources. So there's a lot on the school portal and there is more coming as well. Of course, do not forget your own internal school moderation processes before you submit anything to endorsement. That's a really important part of it as well. 
So schools submit their assessment for review through the portal. Everything happens through the endorsement application. And when I say school, I really mean the principal's delegate. What happens then? The instrument will be um, looked at, reviewed by two people. So that's um, two objective gazes cast over your instrument and a decision will be made. And again, that will be communicated through the portal. If you don't happen to have your assessment instrument endorsed the first time, it's not the end of the world. You are able to have a consultation with the lead endorser. In terms of timeframes, those deadlines I was talking about just before, in term three, the first assessment instrument is due in the endorsement application, term three, 2019, so that's less than 12 months away. And the final two assessment instruments, this is for Essential English, are due in Term 1, 2020. Now, when I say Term 1, I mean Week 1, Term 1. So a lot of schools, obviously, are going to make sure their assessments are written, signed off on, moderated, before the end of the year, the previous year in which they're due. So for the first one, it'll be the end of 2019. But support is available. There's a lot of stuff on the portal and I know teachers are avidly accessing them because they're calling us to talk through their ideas and that, and that sort of thing. And, and while we are climbing the cliff of the new, it really is not meant to be a solitary journey and it's not, to, not meant to be terrifying. And that's what our job is at QCAA, it's to support you. In terms of understanding the essence of a syllabus document, it's a good idea just sometimes to dip into the rationale. And I've taken a few key quotes that I think really capture it. Is everyone able to read that? I'll give you a moment just to read it. So those quotes and the image combined really encapsulate the students' development and progress as they move throughout the course, hopefully leading to empowerment, a word that Leanne used already, has used already, and um, enlightenment indicated by the clouds parting in the distance, so a very visual um, replication there. The final bit here in this quote enables students to understand, accept or challenge the values and attitudes in these texts I think is really important and again it links into what Leanne was saying about critical literacy. So as we all know as English teachers, encouraging students to be active negotiators with the meaning in text is, is critical, not to be passive and acquiescent. You use the word mindless dupes, dupes, dupes mindless dupes, which I think is also quite, quite pertinent. As we all know, no unit operates in isolation of the others, and so it just seems prudent to quickly go over the um, holistic view, the bird's eye view, as you like, if you're looking into the syllabus. Four assessment instruments. Today we're looking at the IA3 and the IA4. And endorsement captures, endorsement, well, endorsement is applicable for IA3 and IA4. IA1 and CIA are quality assured through the applied meetings and in terms of determining a student's exit result, it's very similar to what we're currently doing, so nothing particularly scary there. They're on balance decisions and we're looking at the multimodal and the written. So Unit 1 and Unit 2 are foundational learning, Unit 3 and Unit 4 are consolidating learning. Unit 1 shares a relationship with Unit 3 and Unit 2 shares a relationship with Unit 4. And those of you who have already done your Unit 1 and Unit 2 um, programs, teaching and learning and assessment, will have engaged very heavily with that summative phase to work out exactly what you're going to do in this formative. Because as you know, it's, a, it's critical that students have already experienced the assessment that they're going to be doing in the summative phase in the formative, so that they can develop that sense of confidence and feel successful about what's coming. Unit 4, I think, is a particularly great unit and it offers a lot of really authentic teaching and learning experiences for students that, have, that has built progressively during the course and absolutely complements the prior learning. Now, just stepping back holistically, two techniques. We've got the extended response, which is quite standard for the English classroom, and we've got those short responses which we're experimenting with in terms of the CIA. 
four assessment instruments, so we've got more time to really unpack those objectives and hopefully engage with a lot of really wonderful critical literacy to empower these students, which honours those, um, those principles in the actual rationale. So we've got the Spoken and the CIA, and I, I covered those in detail last time in May. Today, the multimodal and the written. I pointed out then, and I'll point out again today, that the, this sil syllabus um, has also kept that balance of the 50% spoken and the 50% written. And that's what is indicated there. So the multimodal has a, uh, has a compulsory spoken component to it. So whilst it's multimodal, one of the modes must be spoken. And that's our focus for today. So Unit 4. It always, well, it never ceases to amaze me, really, how much evidence there is surrounding us when I'm going about my daily life about the importance and significance of this particular subject. It's everywhere. We live in a very um, stimulus-laden society, and as such, delving into texts requires a lot of thought and active engagement. And I think Unit 4 definitely allows us to do that. I was walking down the streets in Sydney one day and this poster, massive, I don't know what you'd call it, poster thing, was up. And it was on the other side as, the side as well. I thought, yes, literacy is freedom, I love that. And I took about 30 photos because that's the kind of the person I am. And thought, that's the syllabus. It's all the syllabuses in the English suite, but it's absolutely, definitely in the essential syllabus. And we do that through Objective 9, where we assess language features, which is spelling, grammar and punctuation. We also do critical, we assess critical literacy in Objectives 3, 4 and 5. We know that there are lots of types of literacy, as Leanne also mentioned. And so things like even students understanding genres and their purpose and intention is assessed in Objective 1. So this is really certainly scattered throughout the entire syllabus. Another day I was walking along the street, my husband and I were chatting away and I looked up and I, I saw that and I kept walking and I thought, hang on a minute, let's go and have a look at this. So we went and had a look at it and it's huge, it's on this massive cement pillar under a huge underpass. My husband and I are standing there looking up at this thing and it struck me as quite curious that we were actually analysing the language features in that particular text. I'm saying, look at this. We've got a man here, black suit, rigid posture, quite dominant looking. Look at his face, looking straight at the camera. So he's, you know, he's not shy. <laughs> even his expression is quite stern, maybe even smug. He's really oozing this idea of, um, you're going to take me seriously. Or I think even a little bit more so, don't mess with me kind of thing happening. And then we look at Jackie O. Eyes downcast, demure, maybe a bit timid, glamorous, smiling, friendly, hand on hip, bit of cleavage. I turned to my husband and said, what year are we living in again? And he said, 2018. I said, are you sure? And he said, yes. And then he said, and look, the man's name is first. And I thought, that's really interesting. This is a popular culture text, which is one of our topics for Unit 4. And it's ubiquitous, it's everywhere. And the syllabus mandates it as a really valid form of study. And it's captured in Unit 4, as already we've heard this morning. The other topic is identities of Australianness, um, concepts, identities, and so on. And that's really important because students need to think about representations of Australianness in text as well as those in Australian texts. Because it helps us, it encourages us to look inwards as well as outwards and compare cultures and see where we relate and fit in our world. But it's more than that. Again, my husband and I were perambulating and we went into, a, into an Indigenous art gallery and this is actually quite small, it's only about that big, but it drew me from the door when I entered you know, that really powerful transformational effect that text can have on us. And I went over and the Indigenous artist is Dale Hunter, and it's small because it's actually painted on Tasmanian blackwood, I think it is. So it creates this really amazing texture in the actual paintwork itself. And I found the image quite evocative and unsettling, and I really wanted to know a little bit more about it. 
And so I went over and I looked at the artist statement. And there are some really amazing ideas and sentiment within that. I'll give you a moment to read it. I found the boy's eyes really quite compelling and I actually felt a little bit ignorant too when I walked in and had a look at the artist's statement. I thought, wow, and I really wanted to buy it. I think I'm going to try and convince my husband that we should absolutely be buying it because when you look at the representations in there, there are representations of family, there are representations of growing up, the burden of responsibility, there's endurance, resilience, conquering, all those things and I think that's why it's such a powerful text for me personally, because I value those things. But when we look at this particular section here, that is perfect for objective five in our syllabus. There's a very concrete link between examining a text like this with our students in the classroom and what they need to actually be able to demonstrate in the assessment space. This is a huge indigenous artwork that my husband and I bought. It's really very large. And the artist is Vera Golder and, her, and the title is Gathering Bush Tucker. I'll let you read the description underneath. But again, as text recipients, we're being invited to respond in some way and there are representations within that particular image. And for me, there's a sense of um, joyousness, their joy. There's a sense of humanity and land blending and working together and even an element of sustainability just in that one particular shot. So, Unit 4 is about Australian concepts and identities and there are some, some ways of looking at it. So, I guess that's my visual representation of the unit in its entirety. So, Unit 3 in relation to Unit 4, I think the titles are quite apt. We've got language that influences and representations in popular culture texts. So really, it's all about enabling students or encouraging them to control the messages they both receive and deliver. And I think that is the pivot point. It captures everything that we do as English teachers. In Unit 3 in Topic 1, students are creating their own texts. So they're actually using cultural assumptions, values, attitudes and beliefs. In topic two for unit three, they're responding to texts. That means they're explaining those cultural attitudes, assumptions, values and beliefs, which is one of our objectives, and they're explaining language features in that text, which is another objective. In unit four, we start off with students responding to popular culture texts. And here again, we've got an image of my son's girlfriend. She's got Facebook open on her phone and we've got multiple things happening on multiple screens, which is our young people's reality today. In the background, we've got Black Mirror. So Black Mirror does have representations of technology and how it's been very dangerous. It's represented as being hazardous. Down here, we've got Wonder Woman, and there are representations there of the female heroine, and as well, I think, of sacrificing for the greater good. In terms of topic two, creating representation, so students are creating their own texts and they're working with Australian identities. We have this. And I see a billboard driving to work every single day and it changes, it, it, it flips over. And I saw a new one today. And the new one was Girt by Sea in that red bit. That's the national anthem. I'm going, oh, wow, this is cool. Um, but the thing about that representation of Australianness, I think, is that it gives off this idea that we're lackadaisical, easygoing, happy-go-lucky, which might resonate with some Australians, but maybe not with everyone. There are some people who think that it doesn't actually represent themselves accurately because they're quite polished and sophisticated, and they don't actually go around dropping their Gs 
all the time. So just in such a simple thing. And I don't know if you've seen these jars. You can argue with your students about whether Vegemite jars are a popular culture um, artefact or not, or fit that definition. But on this one, it's pretty amazing. You've got images of the surf, and you've got some great surf person. I'm, I'm assuming he's great. It's Mitch Rebs, and he says, tastes like the ocean, the surf, and the road trips. This one has a little bit of indigenous art on the label, and they're really beautiful. And on the, on the lid, it's got um, a picture of an indigenous Australian, and it's Claudia Midanothi, I think, and she's saying, tastes like families, island home, um, cut out language, colours, and remarkable history. I think that's really, really interesting stuff that, that we're working with. Just in terms of getting a snapshot of the syllabus as it all fits in together too, because it helps us make sense of things, topic one, students create. So at the start of the summative phase, they're creating their own texts. And they're ending that summative phase by creating their own texts. In the middle, students are responding. So they're explaining other people's texts. And there's reason for having them close side by side. We know that all students in every English classroom sometimes will often find it difficult to analyse text and to get into those representations and see what the text is inviting us to, to, to believe. But having them side by side, I think, in the middle is quite beneficial, especially for students in essential English, because the skills will be quite fresh in their minds when they're moving across. So topic one we've talked about. Topic two we've talked about. What are the classroom considerations? So the classroom considerations are that we need to choose popular culture texts and we need to choose texts that allow students to work with this idea of representing Australian identities, places, events and concepts. The other classroom consideration is that 50% of the unit is critical literacy, essentially, through those objectives, three, four, and five, and, and a couple of the other ones as well, which is quite different to the English communication syllabus. Now, this, the syllabus has some prescription to it, as you're well aware, but there's a lot of flexibility within that prescription. It's important to note that schools make those decisions about text, and that's absolutely as it should be, and that they should reflect the interests and needs of students. That is absolutely not new to us, and nor is this. That Unit 4 must have a focus on Australian texts, and it could include texts by Aboriginal writers and Torres Strait Island writers, so that might be the ideal place to put it. You don't only have to put those texts there, you can scatter them throughout, hopefully people will. But basically, Across the two units, one complete text, and you can see the list there. Media texts, lots of those, and one Australian text. But again, we're focusing and we're zeroing in on unit four. A lot of these media texts, as you will know, have been done in depth in unit three with the CIA and their study on media texts. Doesn't mean you can't bring them into unit four. We probably most likely will because they're so accessible. But if we're thinking about Unit 4 now, it's a good spot for at least one complete text because students have to respond in that multimodal and one Australian text. So where are you going to put those? How are you going to make those fit? So basically you can choose a complete text for the IA3 because students need to work with something. If they're going to be explaining language features, they need something to unpack. They've got to, you've got to give them something to work with and the one Australian text for IA4. So schools can do that as well. Interestingly, you don't actually have to have an Australian text for the IA4. You can do the IA4 without a text, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you some examples. But I'm sure that most schools will probably have a complete text for the IA3 and then another one for the IA4. These are some of the suggestions that came up from the PD syllabus. Sometimes it's handy to have a look at these. So the IA3 is a multimodal, and there are some examples, blog, PowerPoint, speech, etc. Hunger Games is a popular one. 
So students could do a, blog, a vlog explaining representations. You'll note throughout this list that I've used explaining representations in most of them because they're, that's the syllabus language that's focusing us in on the cognitions and the subject matter. Musical lyrics, which is very popular. I was talking to a teacher here before and that was what her students mostly chose when they were given a text type to analyse. Spoken social commentary explaining their appropriateness for a particular audience. The Bachelor. Around my 21-year-old my son is watching The Bachelor. Like, I wouldn't really surprise me. But obviously it gets you in. Black Mirror. See the, some of the, the genre choices. Actually, I'm interested in what, you, uh, what you're talking about this morning in terms of the new text types that are emerging. Like this sort of thing, animated videos, how fantastic. And e-posters, there's so much exciting stuff we can do. Marvel Comics, Avatar is an interesting one. A PowerPoint speech explaining representations of difference. That's, we know teenagers grapple with that. They're trying to find themselves, their sense of self, who they are, their place in the world. So that could be quite good. The film Australia. It did get a lot of criticism, but it did actually get a lot of support as well. It's quite interesting in terms of its representations of the land in which we live. So an interactive e-poster explaining representations of relationships with the land or Indigenous Australians or gender or power. The only reason I've put an Australian text in there is because um, you can bring Australian texts into the IA3, but you don't have to. Really, the syllabus celebrates this idea of range and breadth of texts. So um, you can bring Australia into the entirety of the unit, but most schools probably won't. Or actually, maybe I shouldn't even say that. Schools can do what they want. The syllabus lets them. So in terms of the IA4, the written scripts, blogs, stories, opinion pieces, etc. And here are some options. So in this one, students write a script for a documentary about growing up as a teenager in Australia. The other day, an English communication script came across my desk and I got really excited about it because one of the tasks in that was students doing a survey of their, their, their friends, the school population, parents, whatever, about the issues that, that um, adolescents are facing and using that, the survey itself wasn't being assessed, but that's where they were getting their information in which to work in, for their actual assessment instrument. In this case, students would be looking at that, that text, watching that text, so that they understand how to write a script. So it, it, it serves, serves a structural perspective. It helps them understand what an actual documentary script looks like. Great Australians with Alan Jones, I know. Mm. This didn't come up in the um, PD workshops, but I came across the other day and thought, if we want to talk about noteworthy Australians and a range of representations, maybe that's a possibility. Um, Clever man, students write a series of digital diaries. Again, that's an emerging text. And this is what I was saying before, no text. Maybe you've covered the complete text and the Australian text in IA3. Maybe students do a compare and, con I don't know. But the syllabus does talk about students being able to create a website where they write about a particular social group and there's a list there. That could be quite groovy, interesting, relevant for some students. Students could write a fable that explores an Australian value or characteristic. It's an interesting text type. And this one here, students create a script for an Australian video game. So for those students of yours who are gaming mad, and we know that it, it's a running addiction in our teenage um, clientele, maybe they can come up with something that has an Australianness to it that we can celebrate. So there are nine objectives, and they're explicitly assessed in every unit including Unit 4, and it's really important that they are explicitly taught and unpacked with students because they need to understand the criteria upon which they are being judged. I liken the objectives to the engine of a syllabus. They're the starting point and the end point. They govern um, our teaching and learning because you can't assess what you haven't taught, and they govern assessment because teaching, learning and assessment has to align. So if we just really go down them quickly, because I guess the idea is to have these fresh in your mind, so when you enjoy the sessions that are coming up, they're in the forefront of your consciousness. So genres, roles and relationships, representations, a very important word, um, cultural assumptions, attitudes, values, I've already, you know, that's rolled off my tongue at least a dozen times already. Language features, text structures, 
subject matter or selecting subject matter, sequencing subject matter, language choices and language features. Now in those objectives, purpose is embedded in every one of them because there's always a purpose to communication and in some it's explicitly expressed. I just thought I'd go over that with you because I know you don't have time to curl up with the standards on a Friday night. This is a time to do it. So we assess students' use of genres, not just because it's to see if they can suit their particular purpose. We, are, we assess students' ability to select their subject matter, not just because, but to see if they can support their perspectives. We assess students' ability to construct coherent texts, not just because, that's really important to read a pleasure. And we assess their use of language features, again, not just because, but to achieve particular purposes across modes. So they're the four where it's explicitly expressed. The others do have it embedded within them. But if you look at objective eight, make mode appropriate language choices according to register, so formal versus informal, informed by purpose, always, audience and context. That's a critical part of the English space. I mean, in terms of the audience, is it grandma and granddad or is it a group of rock stars? There's a big difference in terms of how students are going to pitch their ideas. Last time I said how excited I get about this objective and hopefully Leanne will agree with me. It's this one. This really does encapsulate that critical literacy as of course do three and four and some of the others. But explaining how language features and text structures shape meaning and invite particular responses with a caveat, without killing the text. That's something that's very important. Last time I was here I talked in detail about the language features and the text structures and how they shape meaning. I thought this time I'd actually look at the back end of that objective, which is about inviting particular responses, which can so easily um, be, be forgotten. Um, an example of that was when I was talking about Black Mirror before. I stopped at explaining the representations. I talked about the representations of um, technology being hazardous, but I didn't go any further. What I could have said was, um, technology being hazardous and arousing emotions of fear and apprehension. It's serving as a warning, so that's going the next step in terms of this particular objective. With Wonder Woman earlier, I talked about the representations of the female heroine and sacrificing for the greater good, and I stopped there. I didn't go the next step about how that can arouse awe and admiration for selfless people and um, the value of perhaps wanting to become better versions of ourselves. Again, my husband and I were perambulating and really for me Objective 5 sums up this really nicely, how do texts invite us to think and feel. This is an art sculpture in Sydney in the Domain, it's very close to the CBD and it's called the Vale of Trees. And in these panes of glass there's, a, there's poetry embedded within the panes. So it's a really nice Latin natural landscape and setting to really ponder the poet's invitations and whether you actually accept them or reject them. It's that time to really wrestle with the ideas within them. And here we have Judith Wright who has been coined the conscience of a nation. So trees where their thoughts, peppermint gum, black, salty, white, tea tree hung over creeks. There is, there was a country that spoke in the language of leaves. So students might be able to pick out the alliteration and language of leaves and they might be able to talk about the representations of Australian forest being speckled with colours. You've got peppermint, green and black and white and they might stop there. But wouldn't it be wonderful if our students could go that next step and come up with something like the poets are inviting us. Oops. So in addition... In addition to being able to talk about those represent representations, talk about the way we're invited to ponder the beauty of the natural Australian bush and feel sorrow at something precious as being lost, which is captured here in There Is, There Was a Country and that whispering effect that comes through in that last line. So again, when I think of inviting audience responses, I think rightly or wrongly about emotional responses. So getting students to make those connections I think is very powerful. That's transformational. And that's also validating their own personal responses to text, which they're allowed, obviously, as we all know, to have. This one is Les Murray, and he says, new trees step out of old. So we've got personification there. 
lemon and ochre. Interestingly, there's a lot of colours that both poets are using. Lemon and ochre splitting out of grey everywhere in the gum forest. In there for miles, shade track and iron bark slopes. Depth casually beginning all around at a little distance. Sky sifting and always a hint of smoke in the light. You can never reach the heart of the gum forest. So our students might be able to come up with representations again of colour and, and, and um, greyness being represented as a mist of grey. But wouldn't it be nice if they could talk about how we're being invited to marvel at the magical colours and regeneration of the gum forest as well as, or to talk about feelings of awe being provoked or um, invited to feel awe for its uniqueness and eternal light qualities. So that's, um, that's the back end of that objective five. Now when it comes to standing back and looking at the unit holistically, you can see straight away that IA3 is a responding task, which is our multimodal, and you know that because objective five is being assessed. You can see that the IA4 is not assessing objective five, and that's because it's a creating text. Students are crafting their own, own version of truth in terms of Australianness, because that's the topic that they're working with. I've colour coded it to make it a little bit easier. Here you can see the yellow dots and the cognition of explain. In the IA4 you can see pink and here you've got the different cognitions which is construct. So we need to know what explain means and we need to really unpack it very, very deeply with students. If you want your assessment instrument to be endorsed, it needs to have the cognition of explain in there preferably really high up in the task. We know that our students are minimalists when it comes to reading, so making them really lean is really important. On the other hand, if you're looking at the IA4, you can see the cognitions of construct and use. They would be the cognitive verbs that you would have very clearly stated in your task sheet and or the word create. In that previous slide earlier, I was talking about creating and responding. That's the language that's come across from the Australian curriculum. So you get a really nice bridging between the two, two periods of schooling. Now, we get this question a bit. What is multimodal? What does that actually mean? And we've given you a definition. And that's what I was saying before. Multimodal, in this case, not in every case, because multimodal has a whole lot of other um, meanings attached to it. Students must be speaking in some form. It can be live or pre-recorded example of speech. And it's quite prudent just to mention the conditions because I've had a lot of conversations with teachers who are quite concerned about the length being so much greater in the essential English syllabus compared to the English communication syllabus. But I just want to point out that where essential English says four to six minutes and English communication says three to five, there's overlap, so students can stop at five minutes in English communication and they can stop at five minutes in essential English. With the word counts, it's the same thing. So in essential English, 500 to 800 words instead of the 250 to 600. So in English communication, students can stop at 600. They can also stop at 600 in the essential English syllabus. You just need to make sure that your scope and scale is appropriate for your task so that students can do what they need to do within those particular conditions. Now, just to give you a break from listening to me for a moment, just a really short interlude, keeping in mind the multimodal A3, that definition of explain, and objective five, and there it is there, with the focus of inviting particular responses, just take a moment to share with someone a text that you're considering, a, considering using, or share some ideas about a text that is accessible, for our group of students that will be likely doing essential English and allows them to explain particular audience responses. So I'll give you a couple of minutes
Five minutes for questions or yes, no? Yes, I, I will. Yeah. I so, what, do, when do you want to finish? Um, what What time am I due to finish? Or ten to ten to officially? But yeah. you know, is what's that comfortable? Is that the forty five minute mark or is that the hour? Ten to is, is, is the, the hour. hour mark. Okay. So if you just wave to me at but around. But is that okay two. with you? Going to be finished? Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm, Sorry. I should be. I think the air conditioning's gone. Yeah, yeah. actually, it's okay. pretty stuffy, yeah, isn't it? It's quite steamy. Thank down you the for back. mentioning right. that because I'm starting to. Yeah, we were down there. We're like, I really think it's switched off. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so just 10 seconds to finish up your conversations. You're a very attentive group. That was lovely. Thank you. So lock those thoughts that you've already had in. You'll have lots of opportunities to develop them further, I'm sure, during the day. Has anyone seen this Cognitive Verb Toolkit on the portal? Yes, okay. So I don't need to say much about it other than there are some handouts in it. So it's not in the syllabus section of the portal, it's the top right hand corner of the first screen that you come into and it talks about evaluate, analyse, explain. Obviously I'm using the explain one because that's the cognition we use here in Essential. It gives you a, a handout with the categories of the cognitive verbs. We know that explain is lower down the hierarchy than analyse and evaluate. And we know we assess, explain in essential English, but that doesn't mean students don't evaluate in the teaching and learning and that they don't evaluate, sorry, and analyse in the teaching and learning. If students are capable of doing it, then we're not going to stop them. The, um, the clarity here is that we don't assess them on it. So if they can do it, that's great because differentiation is widely recognised as a valid um, form of pedagogical practice. So we're not going to stop them, but it's just a matter of what we assess. And there's this little handout as well, which again is what is, is, is cued into what I was talking about earlier, about really breaking open those objectives and spending time unpacking them with students. So students have the chance to think about how well they really understand that cognition and how good they are at it. And the teachers have the opportunity to give them feedback on how well they're actually using that cognition. And hopefully the two will align. You know how we have students who think they're really good at explaining, but they actually aren't quite getting there. So that's quite a handy little document. I did this last time, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. I guess it's just to reassure you really that the qualifiers in Essential English are very similar to those in, um, sorry, the qualifiers in English communication are similar to those in Essential English, but there are some differences. So again, it's going to be really about looking at the instrument specific standards in detail. And this is what the IA3 looks like. Up here you've got the objectives and again you can see objective 5 sitting in there nicely and you've got 3, 4 and 5 all with the cognition of explain. If we look and see what that actually appears like or looks like in the standard matrix, if we look at standard C, you can see that it sits in there, explanation of the ways cultural assumptions, attitudes, values and beliefs underpin texts and here as well 
explanation of how some of these elements shape meaning and invite particular responses. And that's that back end of objective five that I was talking about earlier. Now this is a task. I don't think it's on the portal yet. I think it's on its way. So I'll give you a moment to read it. And it's not all of it, the missing bit. I can't, but I can read it for you. You are a vlogger who has been asked to review a transformation of a text for a popular YouTube channel titled Epic Mashups. You will respond to the way the new version of the text conveys meaning and various points of views based on the original work that has been adapted or reimagined for a new audience, etc. The task, explain why the transformation of the text is successful and or unsuccessful in its remake or adaptation to screen to influence new audiences. The topic for the vlog discussion is old versus new, why does it work? So we're just going to do a little check here, map it against the objectives, because you'll be thinking about this today. Context, genre, audience, purpose, they're the four things that are so pertinent and prevalent in the English classroom. First, context, is context there? We can see it here because students are told they're, they're being given a role. They are enrolled as a vlogger who has been asked to review a transformation of text. We've also got audience because students know that their audience is going to be for users of epic mashups. So they would need to do some research and find out what that audience is like so they can cater for that in their student response. So we can tick those off. The genre is there, the vlog, so students know exactly what genre they're working with, which is objective one. What about the co cognition though and the purpose, which is obviously absolutely critical? Note, explain is a very first word in the task statement, so it's, it's, it's really being privileged, and that, and that is good practice. And then you've got purpose extended further here, explain why the transformation of the text is successful or unsuccessful. So that's an endorsable instrument because it's ticking off all those components. Um, we haven't talked about conditions and multimodal and that sort of thing, but in terms of the task construction. The IA4, this is what it looks like. I noticed that a lot of you are working with your objectives already. That's great. And you're working with your T-laps, you're adding notes, which is also good. Um, the objectives I've popped up here, you can see straight away objective five is not there. So what does this look like in the standard C? Use of the cultural assumptions of the ways cultural assumptions, attitudes, values and beliefs. They're shaping representations of Australian identities. Over here, they're influencing audiences to accept perspectives on Australian social group. And there are some examples of the groups down here. And there's the task that was actually worked with at the P, in the PD workshops. I'll just read it for you very quickly. We've got context, it explores representations of Australian identities, and it must do. The task itself is create, note the verb, the cognitive verb create. Create a short story that positions audiences, that's the language of the objectives coming in, to accept or reject a representation of young Australians. Choose a representation you have encountered, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You, you may not have seen the actual narrative, the sample student response that goes along with that because we didn't actually show it in the, in the PD. But you can see a controlled use of language. We've got strong verbs, radiates, heat radiates, shimmering light, transparent as, as water, as sweat drenches a teenager's body. But I don't think you can see any Australian representations in there, not in that part of the short story. So you'd be thinking, well, you know, where is it? But if you keep reading, at the very top here, you can see the Australian representation start coming in. So you know how you couldn't watch Bathurst on the weekend, she asks, continuing to smirk as I get frustrated. That's a, that's a value coming in. That's an Australianness. Bathurst is a national event and it's followed by a lot of people. Down here you've got references to towers of hot pies and packets of chips. And down here, the student has changed happy birthday to you to happy birthday. You try and say it. I kid you not. It's really hard. Happy Bathurst Day to you. Happy Bathurst Day to you. So there's some really nice injections there <coughs> of Australian representations. Now, you've got your T-laps, and that's because 
It'll be helpful today. I also gave you A3 size this time because it gives you more white space in which to take down notes. I just wanted to, on, on, on page three and page four, I wanted to go through and see if we're actually including learning experiences that enable students to really explicitly look at the way texts are inviting particular responses. And this one certainly does. Here you've got students discuss their thoughts and personal responses to comics and children's stories. So as, soon, as, as long as they're being allowed to talk about their personal responses, they're responding to the text in their own way. And there's another learning experience pretty close by, I think it's at the top of the next page, where students are being asked to discuss the popularity of superheroes and villains and why audiences resonate. So as soon as you see resonate, you know that students are thinking about what those texts are inviting them to think and feel. And that's linked into social, ethical and moral dilemmas. Okay. Um, this one here really um, just focuses us in on the language features because I haven't talked about that much today. And here they all are, figurative language, re you know, rhetorical questions, rule of the three and so on. So you can see that in that T-Lab a lot of the objectives are being teased out. But that, those particular, and this is really important, practice identifying and, and explaining. If, I, if, if it was me though, I'd like my students to do a little bit more writing in that. And as you work through that TLAP, think about what you want to do more of or less of. This one here, so the first half of the TLAP is topic one, the second half is topic two. And again, I thought we'd just do a really quick mapping activity against the objectives. Because as I said before, you can't assess it or you shouldn't be assessing it if you haven't taught it. So in terms of, um, so this is on page 11 and 13. We're assessing students' ability to use genres. So we know objective one is getting a tick here. Depictions of Australia. We know that the students are working with representation, so that's getting a tick. Just in this one learning experience. Students are identifying groups that have been privileged or marginalised in cartoons and Leanne talked about that. Leanne used that language this morning. So again, that links into those cultural assumptions, values, attitudes and beliefs that are in our objectives. So that's getting a tick. And working with the theme and message of a text is also drawing um, attention to that. This is an example of where students will evaluate a cartoon, but it's not being assessed in their, their assessment. So, Absolutely, you can use those skills in the classroom. Just make sure you never put that language on a task sheet. Um, planning sheets for narratives. So these are the features and text structures. And so we know that, again, we're doing some work on genre there. So in those couple of um, examples of learning experiences, quite a number of objectives are actually being um, worked with students. So I guess really, keep climbing, don't despair, give up, don't give up, because we're actually nearly there. Bring on 2019, I say. Um, <laughs>